Hello, this is Tom Repass of Canyon Rim Honeybees with the seventh and final presentation in our series about raising queen bees and breeding honeybees. Strategies for small queen breeders to improve queen quality. I began rearing my own queens quite a number of years ago. Uh, I had purchased some commercial queens from queen producers and as it would turn out, they were worse off, they were lower quality than the queens that they were supposed to replace. And, you know, it was frustrating that I had pinched an old queen wanting to requeen it, and the queen that I had purchased was actually not as good as the queen that I had just uh, removed from the hive. I began raising my own queens, and word got around to other beekeepers, even really without advertising, it was word of mouth. And then it became a, a business for me. Uh, to the point that I focus more on queen rearing to to sell queens to other beekeepers than I do on other uh, aspects of beekeeping such as honey production. Uh, eventually I published an article in the American Bee Journal in June 2017 about this very topic. So in this presentation we're going to discuss some of the various topics relating to queen quality including what is queen quality and why does queen quality matter? What are the factors which affect queen quality? How do you objectively assess queen quality? And finally, probably the most important part of this uh, presentation is what are best practices for optimizing quality of the queens you raise? What is queen quality and why is it important? Well, like many things beekeeping, uh, this can be defined in different ways depending on the beekeeper and what is the reason for raising bees. But in general, when we're thinking of qu a queen that has high quality, we, we think about her being able to do the following things. She lays a large number of eggs at a high rate. She has what we call fecundity. She produces viable offspring. Uh, that is, she is fertile. Uh, if she was not fertilized, of course, then she'd be producing drones instead of workers, and that's not very helpful. Uh, she has longevity, that is, she avoids premature loss or supersedure. She is free of disease and parasites. Uh, she's healthy. And then finally, she's able to pass on whatever desired traits you want onto her offspring uh, through genetics. And this can be through her own genetics as well as the genetics of the drones that she has mated with. So why is queen quality important? If she cannot lay eggs at a high rate, the colony will not achieve peak population. And because of that, they won't be able to do what you want them to do. They won't be as productive uh, to produce honey. Or if you're doing pollination, the hive might not be uh, large enough to uh, be able to be used for pollination. A lower quality queen may have a poor brood pattern. She's more likely to fail and be superseded earlier. Or you might have to spend the money on requeening her earlier. Besides being less productive, colonies with poor quality queens are more predisposed to disease and might be less likely to survive themselves. And then finally, if the queen herself does not have the genetics you want, or the drones that she mated with do not have the genetics you want, her offspring might not have the traits that you're uh, interested in. In this survey of beekeeping operations in the U.S., it was estimated that poor queens uh, caused about 31% of colony loss. So queen quality is important, even though it might be something that is not always focused on or discussed uh, when we're talking about uh, raising queen bees. Well, what are the factors which affect queen quality? There are many factors. How the queen was raised. What is her health? how well inseminated she was by the drones which she mated with, and then how diverse was the population of drones which she mated with. So how was the queen raised? A naturally raised queen uh, by bees through their emergency response is thought of possibly not being as high quality depending on how old the larva was that she was raised from. If the bees only had older larva to choose from, uh, then that would be a problem because even though they might raise a queen, she might not be as high quality of a queen. Uh, so when we are raising you know, our queens ourselves uh, and we're grafting, the age of the larva that is selected to be graft will affect her future reproductive potential and performance. A number of studies have shown that queens that are raised from 
larvae that are only a few hours old will be larger uh, than older uh, queens raised from older larvae. They'll have uh, every every day older will have a decrease in body weight, the size of the spermatheca, which affects the number of potential sp stored sperm as well as their ovarials. So in general, queens reared from younger larvae have a higher number of sperm and mate with more drones than queens raised from older larvae. Size also matters when we're talking about the ripe queen cell. Uh, longer queen cells seem to be associated with higher queen weight at emergence. And the higher the weight of the queen, the better, more likely she is to be able to store more sperm and then have a longer productive life. Some chemicals, such as pesticides and miticides, can negatively affect queen quality. We don't use Kumafos anymore for mite treatment, but it can be in the beeswax, and even now they're finding this in some of the commercial beeswax. It can reduce acceptance rates of larvae, uh, smaller size queens, and queens that perform less well. So even queens that are not smaller in size might have lower sperm counts and viability, other abnormalities uh, have way less and have lower ovary weights. Luckily, we're not using Kumafos, but other chemicals and pesticides can also negatively affect queen quality. And then there's diseases and parasites. It's been well known that Nazima can decrease the lifespan and, and egg-laying ability of a queen. Uh, more recently, th this has gotten to be less, I think, as commercially, uh, commercial queen producers are realizing uh, they do need to make sure to manage Nazima in their uh, colonies that are being used to raise queens because this can be a big issue but there are other things as well some of the viruses can be uh, transmitted vertically that is from the queen uh, to her offspring and so these are other issues as well even if the queen herself might not be affected by the virus it may still be uh, uh, transmitted through the egg into the workers that she's producing So how well mated was the queen? So when we're thinking about whether a queen is well mated or not, we think about how well inseminated she was, how much sperm that has she stored, and then how diverse were the genetics uh, of the drones which she mated with. So if she was not well mated, she will not have the lifespan because once she runs out of sperm, then she can't produce fertile eggs and that's the end. Uh, these are defined, you know, whether they're well inseminated, under inseminated, poorly mated. Five million or more is well inseminated. Under inseminated is three to five million, and then poorly mated is less than three million. A 1984 study showed that about 10% of queens were poorly mated, less than three million sperm. A much more recent study in 2010 showed about 18.9% had less than 3 million sperm, with 80% being under-inseminated, less than 5 million sperm. And then a 2012 study showed that the commercially produced queens had an average of 4.3 million, which would be in the 3 to 5 million range, which would be considered under-inseminated, although they did had mated with a high number of drones. And then how diversely mated was that queen? Tarpy found that colonies uh, which were less genetically diverse were uh, less, are more likely to die, less likely to survive as compared to quality, uh, colonies that had more genetic diversity. I have an entire presentation about gen genetic diversity in honeybees and why it's important. Uh, and I, I suggest that if you're interested in this, you might uh, review that presentation. It's estimated that there are about 1 million queen bees being reared in the United States every year from a total of only 500 to 600 breeder queens. Well, think about that. If, if this was some other livestock like cattle, and if, if all cattle trace themselves back to 500 to 600 uh, you know, breeding stock, uh, you know, that would be a very inbred population. And so this is, can be really problematic. I've shown this slide before showing what can happen if there's excess inbreeding. Now again, you can have a poor brood pattern for many reasons. Their brood diseases can do this, parasitic mite syndrome, you know, so on and so forth. But inbreeding is one problem that, that can also attribute to a poor brood pattern due to decreased brood survival. Drone quality is important too. You know, they're the source of the sperm and they're the source of the other half of the genetics. Uh, they, they found in some studies that drones produced from commercially reared queens might have lower sperm numbers for unknown reasons. 
There can be significant variability in the semen quality and viability depending on the season and the age of the drones. As I had mentioned uh, in, an, in another presentation in this series, uh, you know, if there's a drought, the, there may be drones present, but they may have minimal semen. And I did not even know that until I was learning how to do instrumental insemination. I was trying to collect drone semen, and I could I had difficulty collecting enough drone semen in order to instrumentally inseminate queens. And it just it only raised the question to me, you know, if I'm having trouble getting enough semen for instrumental insemination, what's going on in the DCAs, you know, where my queens are out there open mating? Are they also struggling to get uh, well mated? Uh, and so this can result in poor mating at certain times of the year. So drone quality is also another factor that may affect mating quality of uh, queens. Many of us believe that nutrition is important for healthy queens, but this study uh, showed that pollen, protein supplement syrup, didn't really have any effect upon queen or drone quality or physical characteristics. So this is a little bit different uh, than what many of us understand. But I need to point out, this study was done at a time of year when supplemental feeding is not routinely done and there was abundant forage. So it might not be quite as important if you have a pollen and honey flow going on, then perhaps it's not as important uh, to provide these supplements, although it may still help improve cell acceptance. But at times of the year where there might not be enough forage coming in, it may still be useful to uh, to use the to provide supplements, protein supplements, so the nurse bees can provide lots of royal jelly uh, to feed those queen cells that you have placed within the cell builder. Okay, how do you uh, objectively assess queen quality? Many beekeepers, uh, you know, just look at the hive, look at the brood pattern, you know, eye, what's called eyeballing, just see how, you know, I think that, that the queen, she's laying pretty well, that, that's good. Um, and and that's, that's good, that's very good, in, you know, in product, production colonies, ones that we're not really selecting for breeding, uh, but it's not quite as specific, it's very subjective, and you can have, you know, different beekeepers side by side having a different um, assessment. And so that's why if you're going to be having a breeding program, it's important to assess in maybe a more objective matter. You know, if a queen has a poor brood pattern, you know, you already know she's got lower quality as compared to a queen that only has a few skipped cells. If you start seeing drone cells in, in worker brood, especially from a young queen, sometimes they'll do that at the very beginning, the first couple of weeks as they're laying, but that should go away. And if that's persisting in a young queen, that tells you she's probably poorly mated if she's already uh, laying eggs that are un, unfertilized. In an older queen, though, it might mean that she simply has run out of stored semen in her spermatheca and she's at the end of her reproductive lifespan. A brood comb with many missed cells might suggest inbreeding, as I had mentioned before. There's different ways to assess the egg laying ability of queens. Uh, you can measure the amount of brood, but keep in mind there might be differences depending on the season. You know, the, brood, the amount of brood in a colony in June as compared to October will be completely different. Uh, but in general, the higher the egg laying rate of the queen, the higher the expected numbers of frames with brood. So besides simply counting the num total number of frames with brood, some assess the fecundity, the uh, rate of egg laying, by measuring the area of the brood using a grid. This little cardboard square, 2 inches by 2 inches, measures approximately 100 capped brood cells. It's thought that an acceptable level of missed cells should be less than 10%. Um, and since this is 100 cells, you know, if there's more than 10 missed cells, at least in this little window, that means that the missed cells or, or skipped cells is greater than 10%, and which may be a problem depending on how the greater brood pattern appears throughout the hive. So, you know, brood is capped for 12 days, and so if you measure the total square inches of capped brood per hive, multiply by 25 and then divide by 12, you can estimate how many eggs the queen has laid per day. This is probably useful if you're trying to do a research project. It might not be so useful for those of us that are you know, not trying to do research, but just simply finding a more practical way of assessing, you know, the percentages of brood on a frame. So a helpful method was uh, developed by uh, Dr. Larry Connor, um, and you're kind of eyeballing and getting an idea roughly of, of what the percentages are on each frame. And just to give you an example, you know, here's a comb of worker brood, but there's some capped honey, there's some open brood, there's some, uh, you know, empty cells and so on. And if you just imagine that this is divi div uh, divided into tenths, ten sections, 
and then you look at the capped brood, you can see that right here, um, that's roughly 40% of that frame, of that side of the frame anyway, that is capped brood. This one's pretty easy. This is probably 90% or so capped brood, I would say. This one is a little bit difficult, more difficult, but if you look at it and think about that, that comb being divided into uh, tenths, that's maybe going to be 25 or 30% capped brood. I mean, this is eyeballing. You don't have to be, you know, perfectly, you know, accurate just to get a general idea. This one, you know, that what is that, 50%? But I mean, honestly, this this comb has problems. You don't, you know, this is this hive has problems. Um, this is not something that I'd be having in my breeding program. It looks like the bees knew something was going on too because there's a bunch of queen cells that they started. Um, so it could be mite collapse or, you know, it could be another, you know, brood disease or something. It's hard to tell from, from you know, without closer inspection, closer magnification. But yeah, this, this one has problems. And if all the comb in this colony looks like this, this has got a problem and, um, and obviously not something you want to include in your breeding program. Physical characteristics are also used as marker of queen quality. You know, the larger the queen, the larger the spermatheca, the more sperm she's able to store, and uh, likely the greater the ovarials and the greater the rate of potential egg laying. Honey production is correlated with the area of sealed brood and also the size of the queen. Some of these measurements, of course, you can't really, it's not going to help you assess the quality of a living queen. If you're looking at the size of the spermatheca, you know, she's already been killed and dissected. But if I have a queen that has failed, you know, at a younger age, I and I have to, I'm going to get rid of her anyway, I will do a dissection in the field to look at, you know, was she poorly mated? Um, you know, to get some other information like that. The weight of the queen at emergence is a useful surrogate marker. Um, because it predicts roughly the size of her spermatheca and often can predict what her potential egg laying can be. The heaviest queens tend to have larger spermatheca with a higher amount of stored sperm and a higher rate of egg laying. They're also more likely to be accepted by their new queenless, co queenless colony as compared to medium or lightweight uh, queens. Thorax width is also has also been suggested uh, as a marker of queen quality. Um, it's a little bit more challenging to measure, you know, as compared to uh, just weighing the queen. But the larger queens will have larger thoraces, and they they tend to mate with a greater number of drones, and possibly are able to store more sperm due to having a larger spermatheca. So to summarize, you know, physical characteristics. There is many methods to assess, but many of them are just are not reasonable options for small queen breeders to measure. Sure, if you're doing you know a scientific research project, you know you might want to be, uh, you know, get these very precise measurements. But for those of us that are raising our own queens, you know, we, we just want an overall assessment of queen quality, and probably the the best ones are the queen body weight. And then the size of the ripe queen cells seem to be the most practical for if, when we're out in the field and when we're raising queens. What are the best practices for optimizing the quality of the queens we raise? You know, those the, the previous uh, part of this presentation is very inf useful information, but, you know, talking from a more pragmatic, practical standpoint, um, you know, what can we do when we're out raising queens? And then this next set of slides is going to review that. As I've already alluded to, try to choose the smallest larva possible to graft. The, the ones that have just hatched. You try to choose a larva that's maybe 12, 24 hours old, and she just hatched, but she's not filling up the bottom of the cell, and she's not formed a letter of C. So a larva like this one. When you're learning how to graft, you might graft larger larva, and, and that's fine as long as you're doing that for practice. But once you get the skill and the knack of for grafting, to really try to make an effort to graft the smallest larva possible. Uh, it is easy to get a little lazy and pull out some larger larva, but try to avoid doing that. Try to take precautions to keep chemicals out of the beeswax and the colonies you're using for raising queens. Um, this could include, you know, where those uh, colonies are, you know, if there's pesticide exposures and things like that. But also the wax, you know, this is a plastic foundation and um, even though it's plastic, it's inert. Uh, some of the commercial foundation that's made out of wax, some of that beeswax, even now, decades later, still have some chemicals that we really aren't even using to treat mites anymore. 
Um, and you know that that some of these chemicals might be in the in the wax for decades and never really go away. So try to control the the wax that you have in the colonies, especially the ones that you're going to be using for uh, for cell builders and so on. If you can let that queen uh, lay eggs, you know, in the mating nuke for at least uh, 28 days, if you can. Uh, these queens are more likely to be accepted when they're placed in their new colony. Uh, and then plus it gives you some time to look at queens. Occasionally you'll have one that she'll start laying and look okay and then she's kind of, you know, not so good and, and that's better to figure that out when she's in the mating nuke and then you can get rid of her and, and you know, raise another queen than putting her into a full strength colony and finding out that she's not really that all that good of a queen. And consider assessing the quality of your queens and queen cells by physical characteristics. And as I mentioned, the best is probably the weight of the queen and then the size of the queen cell. And then this, try to just get rid of the smallest or lightest uh, 15 or 25 percent. And here's an example looking at small queen cells. I mean, sure, these will produce queens, but you know these are not quite what you're really you know what you're really looking for. But here. These are the type of cells you want. They're long, and they, you can also see through the plastic of the queen cell cup, there's lots of royal jelly. They're just full of royal jelly. And so what happened with the ones on the left, you know, the smaller ones, what happened with that? Well, maybe there were, wasn't enough nurse bees in that cell builder to feed them. Maybe it was at a time of year there was not, they didn't have a lot of resources and they should have been fed, you know, maybe some protein uh, supplement to help them out. Um, but you're really trying to aspire to raise queen cells that look like the ones on the right as much as possible. So I try to raise the largest queen cells, and sometimes I can get some that are just, you know, huge. Well, yeah, these are morel mushrooms, but anyway, maybe not quite that large. But yeah, you want to try to get the largest queen cells you can. Queen body weight can, you know, really vary depending on the time of year. So if you're going to measure the weight of queens, it's very important to be very consistent so that you can compare you know one queen to another queen to another queen if you're going to look at newly emerged queens try to do them right after emergence because they begin losing you know one or two milligrams of weight per day um, you could put them in small cages that you have teared and so that way you can uh, weigh them and be aware that the weight of the queen might uh, vary depending on the genetic origin of the queen there is more advanced assessment of queen quality um, you know, this does cost some money, but it might be useful if you're really trying to improve your breeding program. I, I know North Carolina State University Apicultural Program has had testing of queens and drones, uh, looking at their size, measurements, uh, you know, how much semen they have, the total sperm count, and they also doing some genetic analysis. And this was taken off their website a few years back, so I don't know if, if this is still available or even if, uh, if these prices, they, you know, like everything else, prices change. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, this is something that you might do maybe with certain samples of queens just to see if there's any issues that you don't know about that, you know, you might need to try to address or improve in your breeding program. And remember, drones are half of the genetics. So you want to make sure you have plenty of mature, healthy drones in the area for mating. Um, this may be more of an issue if you're in an isolated location. There are no feral honeybees or other beekeepers. And then also different seasons may have uh, not enough drones or not enough healthy drones uh, to mate with your queens. And to try to monitor and record the performance of your potential breeder queens. You know, production stock, you know, that you're not going to be using in your breeding program, it's really not important. But if you have a colony which has a queen that you think might potentially become a breeding queen, uh, try to look at these a little bit more closely and also at the characteristics of the colonies itself to make sure that, you know, whatever data you're gathering, whatever information, um, it's going to really fit into your breeding program and you're going to be able to raise the best queens you can. And then finally, you know, no matter what method you're going to use to raise queens, how many queens you raise, or what selection method you're going to use to choose your breeder queens, you should always aim for the queens, your queens to be well-bred, raised from colonies with mother queens displaying the genetics and characteristics which you are breeding for, well-fed, uh, the, the uh, grafted larva, uh, had a large population of nurse bees because they can produce more royal jelly, which results in better cell acceptance and potentially larger and healthier queens. 
And then you want those queens to be well mated with lots of drones from a genetically diverse population because the more drones, the better the mating, the more sperm and the more eggs that your queens can lay over their lifetime. And then finally to quote uh, Dr. Farrar of the USDA Bee Lab in Madison, Wisconsin, poorly reared queens of productive stock will be inferior to well reared queens of less productive stock. So you could have the queen of the best genetics you know, and everything that you want, but if she was not raised well, she'll never be able to amount to as good of a possible queen as compared to a queen that, you know, maybe is, you know, not, doesn't have all the genetics you want, but was reared well. And that's why, you know, as a, a small queen breeder or someone maybe who's going to raise queens just for yourself or your local uh, beekeeping community, um, just raising your own queens and raising them well can far outweigh, you know, buying an expensive queen from somewhere else that, you know, may or may not have been raised quite as well as you wanted it to. Well, and that's the end of this presentation. There's a lot of information out there on queen quality, and, you know, here's some of the references that I had used in uh, my presentation and also in that article that I had published in the ABJ. Um, some of these are open access, and you can certainly look them up yourself if you're interested. I, I encourage you to do so. I'm passionate about queen quality, primarily because I had some issues with queen quality when I was purchasing queens myself, and that resulted in me becoming a, a queen uh, a breeder. And with that, that ends this presentation, and also the ends the series Raising Queen Bees and Breeding Honeybees. I truly hope that you found this information helpful, uh, and I hope that you can uh, begin raising your own queens, and her, perhaps even begin raising queens for sale. It's a, it's a wonderful sideline besides being a very enjoyable thing to do. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope that you find these presentations and all the other presentations on my channel uh, helpful.